Hello, everyone, and welcome to 180 Degrees of Impact. My name is Matt Scott, and today I am very thankful and honored uh, to be joined, especially, as I was saying before, on such short notice by Kelly Johnson. Kelly, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, and I'm glad to have you to dive in. And I mean, I, you know, I'll also say just like for transparency for people and for you uh, who are wondering, like, how do you meet the people who you talk with through 180 Degrees of Impact? I saw, you know, you and Writers for Hope on Twitter, thanks to Elizabeth or, or Liz Acevedo, who was posting about uh, the organization and the the auction. And so um, that's how this came about. And I think that's one of the cool things about, you know, 180 Degrees of Impact, because I am genuinely interested in learning, like, your story and um, we'll definitely get into it. But the power of social media is basically, I guess, is the, the lesson there. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll say that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I feel like it's, I wanna actually dive in and like hear more about how, well, I have so many questions, but about how you have used social media to connect um, and just your story overall. But I would love if, if as we start out, you could introduce yourself to the 180 Degrees of Impact audience. Sure. Um, my name is Kelly Johnson. I am the creator of the Writers for Hope annual online auction. Uh, since 2014, it's brought together authors and agents and editors who donate work critiques or signed books or other book-related items. And 100% of the proceeds go to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, which is based down in D.C. It's really cool to hear about your background and a little bit about Writers for Hope, and we're going to get into that much more. I'm sure anyone who's watching or listening is probably wondering, though, like, why, why did you decide to start Writers for Hope? Um, and in particular, I'm wondering, why was writing the focus of, or writers and their work, the focus of what you were doing? Sure. Well, so... I've, I've always been very interested in writing and I grew up a big book reader and it was always something that was really important to me. Um, and then, so a little bit about my, my personal background is I grew up in New York on Long Island and then I ended up actually down in DC for college. I went to American University down there and I worked for, in government jobs for a while because it's DC and that's one of the things you do when you live down there. And I was, I had a job out in Virginia, maybe 75 miles uh, west of DC, but I was living in DC. So every day I got up at around 3.15 so I could make my 4.15 band pool and drive that out. And it was kind of a crazy commute. But one day as I was leaving for work, uh, there had been an individual who had followed somebody into the apartment building. Uh, he didn't live there. And he was kind of just out in the hallways. And when I left for work that morning, uh, he forced his way into the apartment and um, I, was, I was beaten, strangled and raped. Now I was, I hate using this word because it feels so wrong, but it's also accurate. Very lucky that morning because um, my best friend was there and she was able to get the police there. And the individual who did this was arrested on site and um, has actually was ultimately sentenced to 24 years in prison, which is an incredible sentence for that kind of a crime. Yeah. So frequently people receive very little, if anything. Um, so, I mean, I had had such uh, a fortunate life up until that point. It was really idyllic and I was very lucky to be surrounded by people who really supported me, but I had never, I had never experienced anything that required a lengthy recovery period. And I mean, I, I went to therapy right away, which was wonderful. And again, just had people around me who I could talk to, which for me was just all that really got me through. And as I got more involved with the legal case against him, and then I, I discovered Rain and was really using their resources. Their hotline is incredible. Um, I use their online hotline a lot. Um, I, 
I became more aware of how uncommon my story was in, in the realm of this crime. To have so much support and to have the legal system really work for me and to have him go to jail and just all of those steps, there were so many things that could have stood in the way of that. And I went through a period where this was probably three years after the fact. I had done a lot of like my personal recovery and was really working on that and was starting to feel more solid on my feet. And all the progress that I was making kept kind of taking a few steps back because I started really seeking stories about rape in the news. And it was... I don't know that you can really necessarily call it survivor's guilt, but it was something in that realm of, yeah. I had had so much support and there were so many people out there who didn't. And I felt like the least I could do was read their stories. Yeah. But I still wasn't helping them. And I was also completely undoing any of the work that I had done for myself and was getting to a point where I was going to be useless to everybody. And um, my mom really helped with that because I was talking to her about it and I was having really difficult times um, regularly, like going to the bathroom at work so that I could just cry for a few minutes before coming back. Um, and she, she just asked me how what I was doing was going to be helpful to those people. And I really thought about that and it wasn't. I mean, it was a nice thought to read people's stories, but they're still alone. They're still going through this on their own and not doing the justice that they need. Um, so I, and I was hurting myself in the process. So I took a step back and um, I became a member of the Rain Speakers Bureau in 2012. And I had done a little bit of work with them. Um, so I started really looking into the different things that you can do with them. And in 2013, I hosted a fundraising dinner in New York. And that was mostly just people who I knew and people I was really comfortable with. And the turnout was great and everyone was really lovely. And I was trying to think of a way that I could kind of keep moving it forward. And so in March of 2014, and I chose March because that was the month that I was attacked. So it was a month that I felt like I needed to do something. and. So April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so it kind of dovetailed well into that. Uh, I decided to try an online option. And I had a lot of my time on Twitter. It really kind of came together because of social media. Um, I spent following authors who I liked, whose books who I had read, and different agents who, who spoke a lot about the publishing world. And so I decided to just send them emails the people who I followed and see if anybody would be willing to be part of what at that point was a 24-hour option. Yeah. So I drafted up this email and I went to send it and I was just terrified. I mean the thought of reaching out to these people who didn't know me from a hole in the wall to ask to try to be part of this completely untested event mm. was absolutely terrifying to me. But I sent out these emails and people's responses were immediate. I mean, not only did they write back and were so generous with their time and resources, but people were genuinely excited to just have a way to help in some way. And so that's kind of how the auction started. And last year, so the first year we had 37 donors. Um, this year we have 85 right now and a couple more people have, have emailed me. And last year was the fifth anniversary of the event. So we extended it to five days and that was really successful. So I'm keeping it that way now, but it's been really interesting to watch it grow. And the fact that every year at the end of it, donors and people who are bidding write me their emails and just, just let me know how happy they were to do something. And it's a really, for me, I consider it kind of my annual reset every year because, I mean, the news can be really pound you down and it can be very hard to like keep that feeling of hope. And then once a year, I get to get all of these people who are just so excited to give of themselves. And it's just really like a lovely way to kind of, kind of give you the, what you need, the fortitude to keep going forward for the rest of the year. 
Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm so, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And Absolutely. I'm so thankful for, for you legitimately thankful <laughs> for you, despite like, even what I mentioned, just like discovering you and the work you were doing. Thanks to social media. Again, the power yeah. of social media just like this week, really. Um, because, you know, about, I guess almost nine years ago at this point, that's when I started college. So it's right mm -hmm. around the time of, you know, what you were, you were explaining about like yeah. your experience of rape. And, and I think, you know, shortly after that was when I started to get involved on my university's campus here in Washington, DC, George Washington university mm -hmm. um, with students against sexual assault. And it's because I had a friend who was engaged and, you know, I've stayed engaged since then, like doing workshops and education. And, and actually, it's, it's interesting, because like my time in college, I think was really formative in the sense that um, just in, you know, working with survivors, I felt like um, that's something like, I, I look back at college, and like, oh, well, that's the part that actually had meaning. There are lots of good moments that we all have, but that's the part that had meaning. And right. so the work that you're doing resonates with me because I know it's meaningful to a lot of my friends who I hope will be watching and hearing about the work that you're doing. Um, and also rain where a lot of my friends are also have either been on the hotline or are on the hotline still. So again, like so many different touch points there, but I think, you know, the, the thing that's also powerful for me is what you were explaining about like, three years later, just still feeling like you were experiencing that emotion and that really that trauma. And um, I am, you know, I just, I guess I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about that process for you. Like I know the term post-traumatic growth, you know, after trauma, you know, the course of events that leads you to grow in some way and maybe like turn something I don't know if I would necessarily say turn something negative and positive, but follow the negative with the positive because of, you know, the negatives in your life. Um, and I know that personally because of like losing my dad and facing that trauma and doing a lot of reading and education around that. So I'm curious, like from you, I mean, I, I got, I guess you got into the why of what you do, what you do, but do you have a sense of how that process actually happened to you to go from three years later where you find yourself still facing that emotion and that pain to then, you know, after that and, and to this day creating something that, as you said, is a reset for yourself, but also I know has raised tens of thousands of dollars for, for rain and supporting survivors. Sure. I, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the recovery process is, is so interesting and honestly it's ongoing. Um, so I ended up going to therapy pretty much immediately because of the legal process that I went through. Down in DC, they have um, crime victim services. And so my, the first therapist who I went to was through, through that. And I remember um, going to see her and her telling me, like talking to me about all the different things and talking to me about post-traumatic stress disorder and saying that um, I would likely be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder if I was still experiencing distress a month after the event. And I remember laughing and saying, well, sign me up. I mean, it's done. I'm only going to still be experiencing stress a month after this event. And so this, this past Monday was actually the nine year mark. Wow. And I, I mean, there are still very bad days that I'll have. And even knowing that, looking back now, I mean, the stuff that I'm able to do now, I never thought I would be able to mm -hmm. in the years that followed. I mean, it took me, it was roughly 11 months before I slept alone again. I mean, I had my, my mom sleeping in the room with me. My sister would come and visit. My best friend who I lived with, like, I just needed somebody to be in the room with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I remember thinking, well, I'm never going to live alone again, and I'm never going to, to do stuff on my own again, and that's okay. And just being very much like, this is just, this is the new normal for me. Yeah. It's got to be somebody within shouting distance at all times. 
And so it was, I mean, looking back at it now, it all seems very like a, a long process. In the moment, nothing felt really long. It all seemed like it was happening very quickly. Um, but it was, I mean, I look back at that three-year mark when I started to really think about doing this sort of stuff as a turning point for me because I had, I'd already been doing a lot of different work up until that point. I mean, when I was attacked, I had just received my acceptance letters to a couple of graduate programs. And was a, I mean, there were so many feelings in the beginning and a lot of it was anger. And I feel like anger gets a bad name sometimes and I, I get why, because if it consumes you, yeah. it's problematic, but it's also a really good motivator. Right. I remember going to a hotel the day after the attack with my, with my family and being alone in the bathroom for a minute and just looking at myself in the mirror and saying out loud, like he, he has taken so much from you, but from this point forward, anything that you give up, you are giving away. Like wow. taking it anymore, you're giving stuff away. So don't give anything away. Um, and I started going back to night school uh, that September. So about six months later, and when I look back on it now, I feel like I could have been a little bit kinder to myself and given myself a little bit more breathing room. Yeah. But in the moment, it's what I, I had to do. I, I couldn't miss a step. I had to keep pushing forward. And so by the time the three-year mark rolled around, I was done with school. I had, I had moved to a different job. I was kind of getting back into, I joined a community theater. So I was doing something that wasn't like holding my, my best friend's hand all the time. It was something I was doing. And I had started thinking about leaving DC because I refused to leave DC in the beginning because I felt like that was giving ground that I didn't want to give. But at this point, it started to feel like something that could be my choice. And I looked into taking a, a trip to Ireland, which I had studied there for a semester when I was in college, and I'd always wanted to go back. And it was going to be a trip that I was going to do on my own, which was mind boggling to me that because I had thought I would never be able to do anything like that on my own again. And the fact that I was really considering it was such a big step. And so the three, the three year mark to me will always stand out as kind of the time where I was able to, to stop just focusing on present together and start thinking about things I would do in the future. Yeah. And so from there, really getting involved in raising money for rain ended up being um, a big coping mechanism for me going forward. Cause it felt like I was doing something. And it kind of kept me from, from going back into that, that dark place where I felt like I had to find all of this information. I had to ferret out all of these really dark stories to feel like I was contributing in, in some way, even if it wasn't. Uh, so now I have, so I do the auction every year, which is great. And I, I keep in touch with, with Rain a lot. As of this year, I was very honored to be included on their National Leadership Council, which has just been wonderful. Mm -hmm. There are still days where just everything screeches to a halt for me. And it's, there are the obvious things that can trigger things and that can make you think about bad times. But what always gets me are the ones you don't expect. And this was a few years ago, but I don't know if you ever saw the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock, where she's out in space. No, um, I haven't seen she, it. Yeah, so she is a, an astronaut out in space and everything goes wrong. And basically the entirety of the movie is her alone in space trying to figure out how to get home. And I went into that movie thinking, okay, like it, uh, it'll be interesting to watch a space movie. They're always a little bit stressful. Uh, but there was nothing innately triggering about what I was about to watch. And I spent 75% of it just crying in my seat, but also feeling unable to move. Like I couldn't get up and leave. 
And thinking about it after the fact, because I couldn't figure out what in all the world was bothering me so much in that moment. But thinking about it after the fact, the, the thought of being alone in pitch blackness, suffocating to death and yelling and not knowing if anybody could hear you. I mean, all of those things brought me back to a dark hallway where I'm being strangled Mm -hmm. and being told that if I don't stop screaming, he'll make me stop breathing. And it was, it was something that I, it never occurred to me going into that movie that it would make me think of anything. And it just laid me out. Yeah. Those are the, there are a lot of things now that I can plan for and I know, oh, this will upset me or this will be a little bit hard. So I'll have to be prepared for it. But every once in a while, one of those things that will come up that wasn't even on my radar. And those are the things that really kind of slam you. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think you, you touched on something that's so critical. Um, I think as a message to share with people who haven't experienced that and also with people who have experienced that too especially when they're in their like earlier stages which is just that there is no timeline there's no yeah. set timeline or no set process when it comes to navigating trauma in that way or in terms of facing you know facing an event that that leaves a major impact on you and you know you mentioned reading people's stories before and so I'm actually really like curious to hear from you. Did you find that those stories, you know, provided any comfort or, or had some sort of impact on you? Or did that really not factor into your, has that really not factored into your experience? Or in other words, what was the value of, you know, of seeing and reading and hearing other people's stories um, especially, you know, in those, those first few years, as you mentioned. Right. Well, a lot of the stories that I was reading at first were, were more harmful than good for me because they weren't coming from the, the survivors of the attacks. They were newspaper articles and they were yeah. blurbs about this horrible thing happened here. And so that sort of stuff was definitely just sending me in a spiral. But since then, I mean, Rain posts survivor stories and reading the actual words of somebody who has gone through this, I find comforting and empowering and just there's as horrible as, as all this is, there's always a certain amount of, I don't feel like happiness is the right word, but, but something in that, in that family at knowing that this person feels like they can talk about it. Mm-hmm. Because there's such a relief that that comes with actually talking about it when you finally can. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was in 2012, I was asked to participate in something called the Survivors Project, which was a book that of a compilation of essays that was published um, through, it was a special project of the Philadelphia Weekly. Mm -hmm. So I contributed an essay to that and I I have a copy of the book. And that was the first time that I really had easy access to other people's talking about their stories. And to me, that was definitely helpful. So when I hear it from, from the people themselves, there is friendship in that. Even, I mean, it's, I feel like when you talk to people who have gone through different assaults, there's always a, a tendency to basically say like, but it's not as bad as what you went through. Like there, I mean, I've had people talk to me because of the violence of the attack against me um, and be like, well, I, I experienced this, but that's, I don't want to act like it's as bad as you went through. And I don't, I don't really think that that's, necessarily a thing. I mean, it's just a bunch of different types of equally bad situations. I mean, I, I was attacked by a stranger and it was very violent and it was very brutal, but I can't imagine what it would be like to be attacked by somebody who you trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's such a horror in that, that I'll never understand. And 
I was so lucky with my experience within the justice system. And so many people aren't. I mean, there's, forget just the fact that most people accused may not see the inside of a courtroom or will just get a slap on the wrist. You also have so many people who don't even, don't even feel like they can come forward and talk about it because of the retribution behind it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when I hear people able to tell their stories and my story is in some ways an outlier. I mean, I think it's only 19% of people who are attacked are attacked by strangers. And to, to have that and to have the brutality of it in a way makes me a very palatable survivor. I mean, it, I've, I've done public speaking and I've gone to places to talk about it. And I feel like it, I have the privilege of people believing me because of how violent the attack was. And I mean, it shouldn't be a privilege to be believed, but at this point in time it is. Yeah. And I mean, you look at some of the statistics and transgender students are much more likely to be attacked on college campuses than cisgender students. And indigenous people in this country are much more likely to be attacked than other people. And I mean, I definitely, it's been a privilege how many people have believed me. And being able to do this auction is in some ways a way to just try to to raise more awareness of it. And hopefully at some point to be able to at least offer like a platform for other people to be able to get up there and talk about things who have experiences that are just as horrific and sometimes more so than what I've dealt with because they've had to deal with issues that just I'm not faced with. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really powerful though, that you're also like, you recognize that like pain is pain and like difficulty is difficulty for people. And it might look different, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the specific way that they're facing that pain or that challenge in their life. So like, for instance, I mentioned losing my dad as an example, as a major example in my life. And I'm sure I can think of, we could all think of other things that, you know, we might in our own lives rank differently when it comes to like how much it's impacting us. But I think another thing that I, that I've said to some people, and I think people often struggle to accept this is that like everyone has their worst. And so, you know, for me, like in, I would probably say right now, it's like dealing with that and navigating that, that grief and that loss and then turning that into something and and just trying to also figure out, you know, on those days where I'm really down or uh, struggling, like how do I get through that or, or navigate that? And so I think that, you know, that's what that looks like for me, but that looks different for lots of people. And so I hope that if people are listening or watching this, that they could also like see their own experience, you know, in, in what you're saying. But I think also the, the other piece like around just stories, I feel like in, in just listening to you, the tie in with like all of these authors and I was flipping through the mm-hmm. donors page and seeing all the, faces and like looking at just what some of the donations were for this or are for this year because the auction is coming up very soon um you know i was really thinking to myself like it, it's so powerful um i experienced it through 100 Day degrees of impact you're a great example of that of someone who's like decided to take the time out and i'm so grateful to share your story and you know every you know everything that you've experienced and also just what's in your mind but um like looking at all of the authors and looking at you know what you're doing with your auction it's just so powerful to 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 see that people are really behind it and that it's so meaningful and something i was thinking about earlier today is just that i'm sure if you or if i or anyone were to go to those authors and ask them why do they why do I support? There'd be so many different stories 
Um, and I know that on, on your website, you know, you talk about how one in six women, and I believe one in 33 men in their mm -hmm. lifetime are sexually assaulted. And so it's just interesting to think about how, you know, and I say this in workshops that I do that, you know, often there are, there's a large number of people who have been sexually assaulted or experienced some form of sexual violence, but then, you know, there are also so many survivors out there and, you know, often we don't know it. And that's something I tell people to keep in mind. And so um, it's just interesting to think how much people are touched by this, whether it's you or a friend or a story you've heard in the media. Um, but, I, yeah. you know, yeah, totally. It's, I mean, it's such an incredibly dehumanizing crime. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, what happened to me, of course, was deeply impactful on my life, but it also greatly impacted the lives of every single person who loved me. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my parents were drove down in the middle of the night, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, my brother and sister were, were coming there and just, it had this ripple effect on everybody. And I've, I've watched everyone in my life deal with the trauma of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't think of anybody who was more traumatized with, along with me than my best friend who was another victim of the attack in that mm. he had to, as she struggled to get the police there, she had to listen to me being attacked. And we, we had to deal with that. And she got, I mean, she saved my life completely because he was very clear that um, he did not plan on leaving me alive. And had she not gotten the police there, he would have killed me. And then if he had known that she was in the apartment, he probably would have then gone after her. I mean, she completely saved our lives, but she was left dealing with guilt over somebody else's criminal choices because while she saved my life, neither one of us could stop what happened. And I think after the fact, it was, it was easy to see how, how things impacted me because I was the, the primary victim of the physical assault, but there were times where I felt like people didn't completely grasp that she was just as much a victim of this attack. And then as a result of that, our friends who came to the hospital that morning and who were there for us throughout all of, all of our healing together and our parents and our siblings and our extended family, I mean, all of these people still deal with the trauma of what was ultimately 15 minutes of my life. Yeah. And I, I will always really appreciate that in addition to serving survivors, Rain has a lot of literature and resources for the loved ones of people who have been attacked because that's a horror in and of itself. And it can be, I feel like it can be harder for people when they are not the, the primary victim of a crime to easily explain why they have been so traumatized. Yeah. And it's, it's just such a complicated sort of snarl of emotions that people have to deal with. And I remember sitting um, in the courtyard at my job six months after the attack and just weeping and being on the phone with my, my mother and saying, I thought I'd be better than this at this point. Like I couldn't, understand. it's been six months. How am I not okay? And looking back on that now, it's ridiculous. But in the moment, you just, you want these emotions to feel better. You just want to find a way to feel better. And at least for me in my situation, I was able to be like, well, this happened to me. So this is why I feel like garbage all of the time. Mm -hmm then the people around me, I, I think sometimes it can be harder to justify how you're feeling to other people. And it shouldn't be. I mean, it's, if something horrific happens to someone you love, you're going to feel that. 
and you're going to be changed by it. Yeah, and I, I'm like I'm really hoping, and it really seems that, and I, I'm sure that I'm pretty sure this is the case that you know, even then or back then, I should say the conversation wasn't what it was. The way that yeah. stories were being shared weren't what they they are now, and we didn't even have you know the quite the same strength of social media in terms of people standing up and in terms of people on this vast scale, at least using hashtag me too and speaking up about their own experiences. And I mean, I mean, just from a narrative perspective for me, it's interesting that then I, you know, let's say six, seven, eight years ago, I didn't have friends who were talking about, like sexual violence and talking about um, what I, I um, had a mentor at one point call it, you know, secondary survivorship. So the person who's like supporting the person or the person who's somehow affected by, you know, someone else's assault. And um, it's interesting because in the last couple of years or last year and a half, especially, I've had people who are some of my best friends in, you know, some of these group texts, like mentioning, uh, like sexual assault and talking about that and speaking up about Title IX. And it's, it's really, I think, good that there's more of the dialogue because I hope that people will continue to hear stories and then realize like, okay, I was assaulted or my friend was assaulted. Um, here are some of the realities of that or here's like what I need to know, for instance, that there is no set normal response um, or is there, there is no set story one narrative for how things take place or how they go you know and as we've already talked about um and also there's no you know set reaction in the sense of hey i'm going to like you know continue to 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 feel upset or to continue to feel beaten down by this because that that is something that could happen but i think you're also a great example of like somehow creating something out of this that is really beautiful and impact was you kind of, as you mentioned, uh, and, and I kind of want to get into that because I'm wondering for you, how, how did you even like get to the point where you're creating what you've created? Because for me, I kind of like what you're saying, like you wrote that email to some of the authors that you follow on social media and then you were mortified. And so I feel like that's me. And I would probably hesitate to do that, especially if I'm asking for a donation that I could include in an auction, because that's another level where they're thinking, I don't want an autograph and send you. I don't know what this is. I need, you know, I don't know. So how did you manage, at least from a process perspective, to create what you've created with the auction now in its, its sixth sixth year I think I read yes yeah it's sixth year it's crazy to think about that um but yeah I mean it definitely every single time I hit send it was terrifying and it was just everything about it felt horrific to me but I think the only reason that I kept hitting send was because it was it was something that just had such an impact on me I felt I had to do something or I was just going to break apart. And so this was something that I could do. And even as horrifying as it was to hit send, it felt worse to do nothing. Um, That's what kept me doing it in the beginning. Um, And then people's reactions were were so warm and so open that it, it definitely started easing that. That being said, to this day, when it comes time to send out the emails for the, uh, for the auction, there's always a part of me that's like, oh, I'm sorry. And then I hit <laughs> Right. You feel, because you feel like you impose on people and, and all of that. And that's hard to get past. Uh, but the, the first year I had a blog at that point, I had started a blog a couple years ago that was all just sort of nonsensical writing, uh, just different little stories about, you know, dreams I'd had when I was a kid or a, the fact that we kept getting attacked by squirrels in DC. The squirrels on a campus like to run up people and it's horrific. <laughs> and 
<laughs> I haven't experienced that yet, by the way. <laughs> Try to avoid it. <laughs> but I, so I had this blog and I decided to do it there. And it was very just kind of pulling like things together at the last minute, trying to make it happen. And I had no idea when I started what goes into an event like this. And that first year, I think I, I did a turnover in a week. So I started asking people for stuff. And then a week later I did the auction. Wow. Is bananas. Um, but at that point, my goal, I was really hoping to raise a thousand dollars and we ended up raising about 2,500 that year. So once I was like, well, nobody knows who I am. No one has heard anything about this auction ever that I was able to raise double what I wanted to raise. Okay. I'll, I'll build on this and I'll keep moving forward with it. Mm -hmm. It was on the blog for two years and then I moved it. I created the website that it's on now. Mm -hmm. And um, when I shifted to the website, I actually got a couple emails from different um, sites that post auctions regularly and wanting to know if I was interested in their services and all of them that I looked into do great work and really host like very smooth auctions. But because of the amount of work that it takes to create this auction, I paid a percentage of the proceeds, which believe me, they would completely deserve. But it was really important to me that every cent raised in this auction go directly to rain. And so the only way that I found to do that is to do it myself on the website. And it's a little bit still makeshift. I mean, people do their bidding in the comments section and I try to go in every night and on the main donation page, kind of let people know where the bidding's at. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more manual labor into it than um, if I was using an auction site, but it, it keeps it at the hundred percent going to rain, which at the end of the day is the real goal. So, I mean, that's kind of how it's gotten to where it is now. Wow. I mean, and, and it's powerful. I feel, feel like I'm in awe of this because, well, probably for, for a bunch of reasons, but because, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about how there are a lot of people who will champion like politics as a way to create change and to make a difference. And that is powerful. And there are a lot of people who will also like look to create technologies or innovations to change the world. And then there are people who are also doing a lot of fundraising that make, makes a difference. And I think just for me to look at just like the amount and the what's happening with what you've created that you are running, as you said, in such a manual way, like it, it also reminds me and I think should serve as a reminder for other people that like it's, I mean, sure, it's a lot of work to make a difference, but I think if you make the choice to do it, sure, you might be putting in a lot of those hours and a lot of that time, but that's really powerful what you're, what you're doing. Uh, do, you, do you have any like advice for people from a process perspective for actually putting on something like this that is like fundraising for a cause that they, they care about? Yeah, I mean, it's basically don't, don't be too discouraged if it grows slowly. I mean, that, that was a big thing for me is just allowing it to grow at whatever pace it's going to grow at and expanding it when it felt like there was enough interest to expand it. Um, and also, I mean, in terms of the things that people are, are passionate about, I feel like that's always the best place to start to figure out how, how to fit what you're passionate about raising money with, with something that you have another connection to. I mean, the reason that the Writers for Hope was the way I went was because I already had a connection to writing and I already had a connection to books. So it was kind of a, an easy doorway for me to create for myself. And I think it's important with whatever causes that people want to dedicate themselves to that they try to stay as aware of what's going on in the world as possible without getting completely lost in the enormity of it. So knowing when you need to kind of check to see what's happening in the world and when you need to say, I'm going to go lay on my face for about 10 minutes and break and 
kind of recenter or do whatever you have to do to, to get yourself back where you need to be. And um, for me, the auction is, is something that I, I love so much and it means so much to me to do. It's also exhausting. By the time it's over on the 5th, I am going to be just like a puddle on the floor because that is what it is every year. Yeah, and you deserve it, of I, course. <laughs> anytime that I get an email from anybody after the auction telling me that me and my team did great, I'm like, I succeeded because it's just me and my dog sitting at a laptop just like typing away. <laughs> so that, that's my team is this little weird French bulldog. but. It's, I mean, anytime that I successfully manage to, to make it happen without huge mistakes. And that's another thing is every year I make little mistakes. I mean, I, I've in no way perfected this process for myself. And people are really kind about it. And they're very good at, I mean, I put up the donor and auction item reveal this week. And there were a few things that needed to be tweaked or I had left somebody's old bio up instead of putting up their, the one that they sent me. And people are great about it. They send me an email. They let me know. I update it. But if you're going to do events like this, I think one of my, my biggest piece of advice would be don't, don't expect perfection from yourself because there are so many moving pieces. And just kind of do the best that you can and let it go when you've, you've made a mistake and just try to fix it as, as it happens. Yeah, there's some sort of saying that perfect is something and some, I don't, I can't, I don't know the saying, I don't remember the saying right now, but you know, it's better to, to do something than nothing at all. And yeah. I think it's easy to get tied up in, in that at times, but you, you mentioned actually like hearing from people about the success of you and your, your team. Um, and so I'm wondering like, what have there been any stories that have stood out for you and just in terms of how people have, reacted or you know things that you've heard n notes or words of gratitude from people along the way yeah well I mean I've I've had a couple people um, who have sent me emails after the fact and they these are bidders who have won a book or a critique and just just telling me that that they have also experienced sexual assault or sexual abuse and just what it means to them to have an outlet for it to somehow contribute to a cause, but not, not have to be part of something that necessarily makes them front and center focus. And to, to find an event that can give them something to be excited about, like getting your work critiqued by somebody or getting a book from an author that you really love and still feel like they're doing something good in the world. I think there's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's so easy to get bogged down by things and just by the world in general. And I think anytime that you can find something that can simultaneously make you smile, but also let you do some good in the world, it's, it's gold. Like anything that you can do in that way is fantastic. Yeah. I've, wondered. I've had, I've started in the last few years having people reach out to me asking if they can donate for, for various reasons. And that was huge for me to have somebody email me and ask me if they can give up their time yeah. is mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it, it goes to show the power of what you're creating because even just in saying like the sixth, this is the sixth annual writers for hope auction. Like it's, that's huge. And I think it takes a lot of time and, perspective and stepping back to see how big that is but that's huge that's more than half of a decade and I feel like you know even just putting it like that like I I appreciate the fact that you've managed to stick with it and keep going and I know that oftentimes whether it's because it you decide to do something else with your life or because it's tiring and a lot of work or you know whatever happens a lot of times people don't continue on for mm -hmm. a year, let alone years, or don't do it at all to begin with. So I just want to thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people will, uh, I'm sure they'll be sending their notes of gratitude before, after, during the auction, just to kind of 
let you know um, how they're feeling about that. But well, thank you. I mean, it's it's really just been a constant honor to work with the people who donate and the people who bid. And I have met in terms of the donors, I've met maybe three of them in person in my, in my life and very few of the bidders. Uh, and it's incredible to me because none of them have any real concept of what an impact they've had on me. I mean, they, they kind of keep me going for the year and remind me that no matter how horrible things can look on the news. There are so many good people who want to give of themselves and who want to make a difference and who are just looking for the opportunity to do so. And it's just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just so heartened by all of them and would like nothing more than just to express my gratitude to them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like the, the other piece of that, um, is that you mentioned like people are looking for an opportunity to make an impact and I think like, in an ideal world, and I definitely need to look through those auction items more closely, even though I'm pretty sure like I'm going to get outfitted pretty, pretty quickly, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, you know, I think, though, that um, I, I wish that there were more opportunities for people to make an impact without even trying. So, for instance, like if you want to connect with an author or connect with someone for a consultation. Or if you want to get a book, it'd be nice if those proceeds went to a cause that um, yeah. makes a difference, like Rain, for instance. Um, but what, one question, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you before we wrap up, really. And one of them is just, what does your self-care look like now? Is it still doing theater? Uh, like, how are you? What, what are those like bright spots in your day? And by the way, I say that as like, finally the sun's coming out um, here in DC. So Perfect timing. That's a good time. Perfect timing. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of different, different self-care things that I do based on the level that I'm feeling I need it at that point. Um, my, one of my big things is just, I, I have a dog now that I just love. I gave her own Instagram account. It's all absurd, but she's uh. <laughs> very bizarre. Um, and I spend time with her, which is great. And definitely spend time with my family and friends. A good balm for me. Um, I, I still read a lot. Um, I, and I love, you know, movies and, and all different types of storytelling. I'm more careful now in what I choose to watch because I, I've heard of different books or different TV shows all that are apparently doing really powerful storytelling. But most of the time now, if I know that it involves any kind of sexual abuse or sexual assault, it's something I'm, I'm probably not the right audience for just because in terms of self-care, it can take me back a couple steps. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still am involved in theater. I've actually worked for theaters for the last couple of years doing fundraising for them and, um, development and marketing and it's it's always that it's always been a very powerful art form to me and um, any any kind of theater that can make me laugh I have a great deal of respect for because I feel like comedy is so hard it's so hard to get people to laugh sometimes um, so I, I tend to steer towards a lot of comedies when I, I need a, a break from things and also, in terms of social media, for me, it's a double-edged sword. I owe so much of the success of Writers for Hope and all those connections to social media. And I've made so many great contacts, but there are also times where it can just drag me down. Um, so my, I'm very active on social media and being on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram when I am not, when I'm in the middle of the auction. And then once the auction is done, I tend to take a break for a little while just to kind of balance it out. Probably with the exception of Instagram because I'm posting pictures of my dog. So, so fair enough, know. you have to make exceptions. <laughs> and I, also recognizing that like the different platforms have just different content and different messages. Like for mm -hmm. me, I find Instagram to be much lighter uh, lighter scrolling and flipping through. And usually it's like, oh, like this, someone's, 
I was going to say someone's cute baby, but honestly, I mean like my sister's, uh, <laughs> my nephew, who is yeah. five months old, who I'll give a shout out to because he's the cutest wow. on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> but enough, enough about him. Uh, you're just taking me to like that self-care kind of mode of the things that spark joy. So Absolutely. I, my nephews are, are a big one for me as well. So I completely understand that. Amazing. So I, I think it's, it's cool to think about like, you know, all those things. And uh, I, I didn't, you know, anticipate kind of going this way to enter my, I guess, one of my last questions, really. But, you know, you mentioned, I mentioned my nephew, you mentioned your nephews. And I'm just kind of like thinking it to the future of um, not just the world that they live in, but in, like in terms of what you're helping create with um, your auction and support of Rain and with your story and even speaking and sharing now. So I'm wondering, one of my favorite questions I'd say, like if your life ultimately were a book or documentary, what would the title of that be and why? Well, that's a really hard one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have to say it's a book. I can't do Writers for Hope and choose anything but a book. Uh -huh. um, but, oh, in terms of the title, that that's difficult. I guess, so when I was probably around eight years old, I think um, the version, the movie version of Little Women came out um, with Susan Sarandon and Winona Ryder. And it was my first kind of introduction to that story because I was a little bit on the young end to have read the book yet. And I remember there was a scene in it that was just in the movie, not in the book. But Joe Marsh is kind of making an argument for why women should have the vote. And uh, a gentleman in the scene tells her that she should have been a lawyer. And she responds by saying, I should have been a great many things. And I remember as a kid thinking, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a great many things. Like, I've never had one particular, like, this is the goal that I, I want to reach. And I feel like we're all a great many things because we all have these experiences and our own personal tragedies, but that's not all we are. It can become a big part of what motivates us to move forward, but we are all made up of so many different experiences and so many different choices. Um, so I, I guess I, I think I would go with a great many things. Nice. I, I like that title a lot. And it, it's, it's kind of making me think like, you know, especially as we wrap up, is there anything like, uh, hmm, I, I guess to reframe this question almost like thinking about your story and being a great many things, often we only see like one dimension of a person and we don't get all of those layers, which is kind of one reason I try to, to like kind of go back and peel those layers and kind of get a little bit more to try to understand people more. But I'm wondering from you, is there anything that you want to share that you haven't shared already or anything that you think like <laughs> isn't mentioned in the conversation from your perspective, whether that's about um, sexual assault or about your potential of being a great many things um, or about theater, whatever it might be. Is there anything that you have just had on your mind or heart that like you haven't shared and really want to share at this point? Broad question, I know, but. <laughs> well, I mean, it's been a, it's been a great conversation and, and talking about all of this. And this, this topic is, is so close to my heart and is such a, a passion of mine um, to work towards this. And it's, it's something that I can easily become consumed by, but I think the, the way that I don't is remembering all of the other things that I am, the things that I've been for long before I ever had to deal with this and the new things that I've become since. And I mean, from the little things like being a Star Wars fan or being way too into the idea of adult footy pajamas, um, <laughs> all those odd little things. Right. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the bigger things of, you know, being a, a daughter and a sister and an aunt and a friend and being on the stage and being behind the scenes and writing and just all of the different things that kind of 
create who you are and the big defining moments. I mean, this was one enormous defining moment for me, but it wasn't the only one. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've said this before a couple of times because of the, all the support that I received and people were so wonderful there. This is going to sound a little odd, but you know, when you go to a wake of some, or a funeral for somebody and everybody's you, once you lose somebody, you remember the, all of the great things about them and the not so great things are easier to push aside because why bother dwelling on those? I feel like sometimes people talk, have already talked about me like it's awake in some ways. They talk about all the great things about me um, and they kind of forget the, the weird quirks and the not so great parts and all of that. And it's, it's really my hope, like when everything is all said and done, to be remembered as, as the whole picture, good, bad, and otherwise. And as important as this, this causes for me, and as much as I know that I will work for it for the duration, it's, I'm, I'm hoping in the end to be remembered for all of the weird things that I have done. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to sum it up and that's actually a really powerful powerful statement and I think that's like that's probably one of the biggest honors to be in a situation in your life where people like I mean for you know people people address you and talk about you as if you were gone but at the same time you know recognize just all of the quirks and hopefully you know that's that's what it's like for all of us where people love the quirks and the good things and the bad things and ups and downs because that makes us who we are ultimately. Mm -hmm. So that's so powerful. Where can people learn more about what you're up to to keep up with and connect with you? And where can people learn more about Writers for Hope? Sure. Um, I, I am on Twitter at KF underscore Johnson. And then Writers for Hope is on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Writers for Hope, and the auction can be found at writersforhope.com, and it starts on Monday, April 1st, and runs through April 5th this year. And if people are interested in learning about the very vital work that Rain is doing, they can visit their website at rain.org. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. I appreciate you taking the time out, especially uh, because I know the auction's coming up, and you're you're a you know just one person team just taking care of everything so thanks a lot for for taking the time out and chatting and i'm hoping that anyone who's listening is actively bidding they know where to find it so there are no excuses and um, again thanks for taking out the time absolutely well thank you so much for asking me it's a real honor yeah thank you and as i say at the end of each and every one of my 180 degrees of impact conversations keep impacting. Um, and again, I can't thank you enough, but I hope we'll, we'll connect again soon. Absolutely.